Happy Sabbath! How are you all? I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful week. I especially enjoy the rain, you know, to moisten our ground, and also hope it helps a little bit with our dry, dry reservoirs. Tonight, I also ask the Lord to pour out His blessing like the rain to you and your family. That you may be filled with his love, his joy, and his peace. And may he protect you as well. And tonight, we're going to continue with the article from the Adventist world. Focus on week of prayer. And the title is, The Joy of Being a Disciple. Why should we be disciple of Jesus? What's the advantage? But first of all, before we get there, let's get to understand in Jesus' time, in the Old Testament time, what is exactly the master-disciple relationship? How do they function or what is the purpose of it? You know, in the Old Testament time period until the first century, Traditionally, Jewish children learn about God, learn about their own culture, and also about what is morally right and wrong, first from their parents. And when they get to 12 years old, then they seek learning through a teacher. They call their teacher rabbi, which means master. And there are examples of this in the Old Testament. Do you remember the relationship between Elijah and Elisha in the book of King? Well, there's quite a few stories there. And then the gist of it is that you, we could see that Elisha was learning through following Elijah around, around to all the different schools of prophet. He followed Elijah all the way until what? He was translated to heaven. And there's another example in the book of Ezra. Do you remember how Ezra, the scribe, and his colleague taught the Jewish people about God's law? Let me read to you. Ezra 7, 6. A teacher well-versed in the law of Moses. This is a description of Ezra. And then Ezra 8, 1, 2. Then they asked Ezra, who is the teacher of the law of Moses, to read to them, from this law that the Lord has given his people. Israel the priest came with the law and stood before the crowd of men, women, and the children who were old enough to understand. According to a scholar, last name is Wilkins, the main educational task for the Hebrew rabbi was to communicate and reveal prophecy, laws, and wisdom given by God. And the main aim of the teacher was to teach the student all this and then ultimately for them to reveal these words of God to the nation, to the people. Jesus' relationship with his disciple reflect exactly that culture. He revealed God's will of salvation to his disciples first and then his disciples to the world. Remember this prayer in Matthew 6, 9, and 10? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples that God's will be done on earth. And God's will is what? Is salvation for all people. And that was Jesus' will and Jesus' teaching to his disciple. And then after that, what did Jesus say? All authority in heaven on earth was being given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them 
to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So after Jesus taught his disciple, and the disciple was to teach the world what Jesus has taught them. So if I could summarize that, if we are disciples of Christ, we would learn from him first and then spread his words to others. You know, sometimes there are obstacles that complicate the process of learning and doing the work of God. We have problem learning the concept from our master teacher. And then because of that, we have problem doing the tasks that we were meant to do. Do you remember the story of the wealthy young ruler who wanted to follow Jesus? And this is what he asked Jesus. Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? He called Jesus teacher, denotes he was probably a want-to-be student, or perhaps a distant observing student. He followed Jesus because he was convinced that Jesus offers eternal life. So he asked what was the requirement to obtain eternal life. When Jesus listed the commandments, the ruler said he had done all of that. And Jesus sensed a deeper weakness in him. And he told the young rich man, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And the author said, the verse 22 capture what was to be or what has to be one of the saddest epitaphs in memory of him. He was a stillborn disciple. Why does the author call him the stillborn disciple? Because he was a disciple that was about to be born, but died before it happened. What was in verse 22? But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Alan White also has a comment about this young man. She said, if he had realized the value of the offered gift, quickly would he have enrolled himself as one of Christ's followers. He was a member of the honor council of the Jews, and Satan was tempting him with flattery prospects of the future. He wanted the heavenly treasure, but he wanted also the temporal advantages his riches would bring him. He was sorry that such conditions existed. He desired eternal life, but he was not willing to make that sacrifice. The cost of eternal life seemed too great. As the sorrowful young ruler backed away, Jesus turned to the disciples and said something that still shocked us 2,000 plus years later. Surely, I say to you that it is hard for a rich men to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich men to enter the kingdom of God. Who then can be saved, the disciple gasped. It was then that a red-faced Peter asked, what no other disciples dare ask. See, we have left all and follow you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Peter thought he had given up everything. And he asked Jesus, so what's in it for us? Can we blame Peter for asking this question? Peter also remembered Jesus had told them frequently about the cause of discipleship. Jesus told them many times that if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself 
and take up his cross and follow me. So what Peter meant is Jesus, now that we know what the discipleship costs, then what's in it for us? Does it pay? Well, the answer is yes, it pays. Peter found out later. We often ask this question too. What's in it for us? And the author had given five points, five joys waiting for those who's willing to dive into the discipleship with Jesus. Before that, let's review. What is discipleship? It is like the student in the Old Testament time, like Elisha and like Jesus' disciples, learning first and following the master around to, to try to hear every word that coming out from his lips and also to observe him in action, to emulate him. And for us, the process of becoming disciple of Jesus is also spending time with him and also to become like him. Now, here are the five payoffs for those who's going to dive into discipleship with Jesus. Number one, whoever make this decision to become disciple of Jesus, they will have the joy of having a purposeful life. You know, in today's world, living a purposeful life is based on what we think we want out of this life. For some, maybe the amount of wealth, recognition in our profession, our status, and or, or power. But in the process of achieving these purposes, these objectives, we became very busy aiming at this and that because we are not sure which path we should take that will ultimately reach our ultimate goal. And so we become bewildered, become stressed, and sometimes confused. And yet, even though these goals or objectives have been achieved, we still feel like something is not quite right. There's still this empty feeling, like something is still missing in this life. A purposeful life, a scholar said, should not be based on what society has dictated for us. Living a purposeful life should be based on what our soul is actually searching for to fill the void. You know, David knew what would fill his void. Let me read to you in Psalms 63.1. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. It has been said, man's chief purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Do you remember this French physicist, Pascal? This is what he said. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man, which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus Christ. So how do we fill Jesus inside this void that we have? In Matthew 16, 25, Jesus gave an instruction to all disciples who choose to follow him. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What he's saying is to put our primary focus in God first in our lives and showing it in our actions. It is to the point of bearing whatever cause there is to being a Christian. 
to be his disciple. It is following the teachers and commandments of Jesus in our daily life, studying his word for instruction, communicate with him, having fellowship with other disciples of Jesus to support each other, and then ultimately witness the good news of Jesus to others. Someone asks, is there a greater sorrow in life than never finding the purpose for which you were created for? Over here, Jesus promises that all who give their lives in service to him will find the life they were meant to live. One part of which is to become fishers of men. A purpose-filled life will be and is a life of joy. Second point, the joy of unconditional acceptance when we become disciples of Jesus. The author said, one of the things I love most about my parents is their willingness to accept and love me, even when I disappoint them. As great as they are, their acceptance of me cannot be compared to that of Jesus. Because Jesus said in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Have you felt the come as you are joy of Jesus, unconditional acceptance? Discipleship with Jesus will change you, but not before he unconditionally accepts you. Third point, the joy of friendship with Christ and God when we become Jesus' disciple. When we walk in relationship with Jesus, we enter into friendship with the God of the universe. What a privilege it is. You know, a well-known musician had the privilege to visit the Queen of England in 2016. Prior to the queen's entrance into the room, she was instructed with all the protocols, such as don't talk until she approaches you, and make a small curtsy because she was a female, and to greet her first with your majesty, and then ma'am for any follow-up conversation. And this is what she said describing her experience. Just before her majesty arrived, the whole floor suddenly fell silent, and you could sense that she was coming. I became quite nervous. When I saw her approach, I was immediately impressed with her incredible presence and command of the room. Can you imagine? This is only with the Queen of England. We have friendship. We could meet the God of the universe. And more, this friendship with our God, with our, with our Savior, come with special prerogative, a special right. Jesus said in John 15, 15, No longer do I call you servants, for servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Can you imagine all the wisdom and power of the universe is at the disposal of every disciple who enters into friendship with Jesus? This is a joy that brings peace to many a careworn disciple. Fourth point, the joy of healing rest and restoration by being disciple of Jesus. In a world of pandemic and peril, dangers, how joyous it is to walk with Jesus. Right now he invites us, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
And then Jesus offers us to exchange the yoke of his will for the heavy, back-breaking yoke of our sin. What an exchange. Anytime I don't want my own yoke, I'd rather yoke with Jesus. And this is what he promised. You will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Of this beautiful promise, Alan White wrote, The Lord never makes a false estimate concerning his heritage. He measures the man with whom he is working. When they submit to his yoke, when they give up the struggle that has been unprofitable for themselves and for the cause of God, they will find peace and rest. When they become sensible of their own weakness, their own deficiencies, they will delight to do God's will. What she is saying is that a lot of people don't understand about yoking with Jesus. We prefer our own yoke. And they pref we prefer our own struggle. And when they truly learn how to yoke on with Jesus, they will find peace and rest. And they will become more realistic of how weak they are, how deficient they are. And what a wonderful opportunity for them to yoke with Jesus because it's such a delight to do his will. The last point, fifth point, the joy of eternal life and so much more by becoming disciple of Jesus. Jesus did answer Peter's question about what's in it for me. His answer represents perhaps the greatest joy of all. This is what Jesus said. In the generation, I mean in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. So one day soon, all true disciples will reign forever with Christ who has transformed us into his very image and that will be joy unspeakable and full of glory happy sabbath